Right. So I'm very, very excited to be uh, on this on this panel and, and part of this conference. It's a wonderful topic, very challenging topic, as I think we're all discovering. And um, I think I was invited to present on. Let me also just put my stopwatch so we don't go over time. Uh, I was invited to present on this topic probably because of this publication um, on recent publication I had on uh, how defining the limits of liberal inclusivity, uh, how defining, is my, uh, oh great, okay, how defining Islamophobia normalizes anti-Muslim racism, uh, which was published in the Journal of Law and Religion in 2020, and there was a, a uh, 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 condensation of that, summary of that was, was, was also presented in, in Middle East Eye, um, and so it's, of course, it's not, I don't have a um, blanket argument against the very idea of defining Islamophobia, but what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, uh, something that's happening in the very UK specific context and in the context in the aftermath um, or not, the, the ongoing uh, challenge presented by the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, I guess, with which anyone who is who is based in the UK will have, will have heard of that, and that's that's the background from which I approach this issue. So again, it's 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 a very specific kind of context, um, which I'll I'll explain this definition in just a second. But but uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that that my um, so I'm also talking about the idea of the definition of anti-Semitism, not not in as a kind of uh, enterprise to just define the experience of anti-Semitism, but but specifically to do it for within a governmental context and an institutional context. Um, and so that's where this IHRA definition of anti-Semitism comes in um, that I've, I've worked on quite a bit. As I said, it forms, it forms the background of my uh, engagement or my awareness of, of the, uh, well, it, it forms rather the background, I think, of, of a lot of the initiatives to define um, anti um, Islamophobia in the UK context. Uh, this was a definition of anti-Semitism that was adopted by the UK government in 2016, and it has posed a lot, many problems in terms of uh, freedom of expression and free speech. Um, and I don't think, and I, I also, to qualify what I'm saying, uh, um, I, I don't see the same issues uh, happening, certainly, um, certainly not in the present, uh, with the, uh, any, any, any proposal to define anti-Semitism or to adopt, anti uh, sorry, to define, sorry, there may be a lot of slippage here, to define or adopt Islamophobia. I do think it is a different case. Um, but that said, I think the experience of what, what how, how this um, new definition of anti-Semitism has been operationalized within UK universities and uh, UK governmental context is, can be very instructive for anyone who is um, engaged with definitions of Islamophobia, particularly definitions that are being called on to be adopted by governments and public institutions, I think there's a lot to be learned from that example. Um, so um, that's that's the perspective, and, and 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 most of what is to be learned is is in the way of things not to do, things to avoid, not necessarily, um, and, yeah, not things to emulate. Um, so that's 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 the angle in which I'm approaching this 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 task, and um, so then that that so I'll briefly sort of think generally about what makes I, I think the fact that yeah the fact that that these there's a discussion kind of going on simultaneously about different these two different different definitions of group specific racism and prejudice um, calls on us to think more generally about what makes a definition useful for fighting racism. And I do think that you know this needs to be pursued in a comparative context. Uh, and and so th there are a couple of things that I have identified, and, and, and specifically things that that um, uh, prevent it from that, that can that can allow a definition of uh, racism or group specific prejudice to to not threaten freedom of expression and free speech. So as I said, this is a this is a very uh, UK specific account. I mean, just in the sense that. I think it, this idea of adopting definitions of racism is a very is something that's happening in the UK. Uh, I see it as being uh, in, in a kind of specific way. This is not happening, for example, in the United States in the same way, uh, perhaps not even throughout Europe. Um, 
it's a kind of UK governmental um, approach to solving problems, uh, it seems to me, uh, at least. Um, and I, I think it could be traced back to the, the um, McPherson inquiry, inquiry in the 1990s, which was a response to the murder of um, Stephen uh, Lewis, the, the, the teenager, uh, sorry, Stephen Lawrence, the teenager um, who was uh, black and was the target, the, the victim of a racially motivated murder. Uh, and that that murder and the inquiry that followed resulted in a report called the McPherson Inquiry, um, which introduced an idea of institutional racism, which has proven pretty useful um, in the in the in, in the efforts to overcome racism. Um, it, it, it's been it's been it's proven productive and helpful. Um, it's also it's also I think been arguably been um, uh, in a very different context, appropriated um, in, in the context of this IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, um, which now I'll just briefly say, I mean, I think, I don't know exactly what proportion of people here are from the UK or will have heard of this definition, um, but the, the, the relevant aspects of it, so again, it's a new definition of anti-Semitism that was adopted by the government and it's been adopted by maybe 30 countries so far and um, uh, it's, it's, it's a definition that is now associated with the um, International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. And the controversial aspects of it are that it um, talks about the, the description of Zionism as racism as a form of anti-Semitism. So it has a very broad, uh, like a max, maximally broad interpretation of what anti-Semitism is. It's, it's, it's not... It tries to go beyond, say, the traditional understanding of, of anti-Semitism as hatred of Jews and, and anti-Semitic tropes and so forth, and really uh, focuses a lot on Israel, criticism of Israel, uh, disproportionate criticism of Israel, um, again, criticism of Zionism. These are all things that are seen as potentially anti-Semitic. And that is in the UK context it, and globally as well, has led to a lot of unfortunate um, incidents of Accusations of anti-Semitism uh, resulting in, uh, say, events events that have been seen as being critical of Israel, uh, especially events that are supporting the boycott of Israel, have been canceled at, at several universities, uh, University of Exeter, University of Central Lancashire, um, and uh, professors have been um, pressured to, they, there have been calls to fire certain academics or students also have been punished, penalized. I think a lot of also has happened that we just don't know about. Um, unfortunately, and, and so I, 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 I'm not, um, and, and there are people, obviously it's, 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 it's popular. It's, the definition is popular with many, uh, many, many Jewish people do not support it. Um, but, but it's a controversial definition. And, and I think my, my view on this is clear, um, my, my lack of support for it. Um, and, but I think what one contribution that I make to this debate is that, um, the problem with the definition and here's where it's relevant, this experience is relevant to the idea of defining it, um, Islamophobia for legal purposes or, or quasi-governmental purposes. And I'll, I'll talk about this in a lot more detail, but I think what I see as the problem with the definition, and although this, these details about, say, um, uh, racism, de defining Zionism as racism and all that is, I, it's problematic. But I think if you really want to understand what, not, not just, you know, what's problematic about what the definition says, but how is it that it has been effective in silencing Israel critical speech? Like, how has that actually happened? How is that even possible? The answer to that isn't found just in what the definition says. Like, it's not a matter of the content of that definition. It, it's to do with what one would call the form of it, the form. In other words, the way in which it's been adopted, the idea of adoption as such, um, and these are all things that, you know, are not specific to any definition of anti-Semitism. It just has to do with any, the very idea of defining racism. So it's a very complicated issue. And, and I, I'm borrowed only on the first slide. <laughs> and I'm, um, I, I have I feel like I've barely just begun. So I'll try to try to move more quickly. Uh, as I said, it's my, my materials are very UK specific. I don't claim, and I think, I think the, the, the speaker after me is, is, is speaking very much from a kind of practice-based perspective, but that's obviously really, really important to be kind of in the trenches battling Islamophobia, uh, thinking actually about how um, Muslims suffering discrimination, how their problems can be alleviated. And and I suppose I'm 
I'm, I'm more of a kind of issuing warnings. And I, I hope that's that's not useless. I, I just think, yeah, there's some, something to be learned from the IHRA definition. I'm not trying to preach to anyone about like, oh, don't try to define Islamophobia or anything like that. But I do think there are things that my encounters, my research on the IHRA definition has ta- taught me that make sort of it valuable or even necessary to kind of issue these warnings. Um, and I just think the other thing about it, you know, we need to think also about free speech um, for a second and, 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 you know, realize that as much as it, it, I think it's so important that, that a conference is being convened on free speech in this context in, in Islam, uh, because the problem is, and I think anyone, again, who, who lives, in, lives in certainly the UK or any, especially liberal democracies will be aware. I mean, it's, it's often promoted as a, as, as a um, free speech is often promoted as, as such a, a universal value that everyone believes in. And it's very easy to promote free speech in the abstract, very easy to, um, it's very common, very, it's kind of very much of a cliche, right? To say, oh, I support free speech. Who doesn't support free speech? But when, when views that, when um, the support of free speech means, you know, allowing for views that, that, that challenge what we believe in and our most dearest identities and values, um, it tends then, you know, it tends to be forgotten. It tends to become something else. Uh, so it can be very easily manipulated. I think free speech is one of those manipulatable concepts uh, or values out there. So that's also part of the problem with dealing with um, it, it, to, to let the defense of free speech not just be a kind of cliche, but actually something that's foundational uh, to any definition of, of racism, I think should be the task. Um, so just a couple of points about what, what would make a good definition. I think one could say that it's it, it, I mean, it's, it's contradictory, right? So and it, it should be as generalizable as possible. Um, with that said, I think it also needs to be as malleable. So that's, that's the first point on the screen, generalizable as possible. Uh, the third point, it should be as malleable as possible um, to the con- according to the context of its application. Um, one thing that we see a lot in the, I- well, very concretely in the IHRA definition is that this is a definition that was um, developed in the um, early uh, 2000s uh, for for persecuting hate crimes. In other words, it was for intended for kind of police usage, classifying whether an event that had that had already occurred could be classified uh, retro- retrospectively as anti-Semitic. Um, it wasn't intended to be adopted as a speech code by universities, and yet now that is that is what's happening. And the government has even threatened that universities that don't adopt this definition, that don't you know ac- accept uh, and implement a um, the assertion that that the criticism of the, of Zionism can be a kind of racism are going to have their funding withdrawn, right? And it's so that it, it, it's such a it's a really shocking kind of uh, misappropriation of, of 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 what was what was in the mind of the, the uh, of, of, yeah the main person Ken Stern who who drafted this definition. And so we ha- there has to be some way of guarding against that in any valid definition. But that that, that that's it's easier said than done. But um, Focus on core rather than peripheral features of the racism, and then I think, yeah, how we can operationalize it. Um, definitions that are excessively context specific. Uh, they, they, that's that's just the problem with definitions, as I uh, as I mentioned earlier. Any kind of definition um, uh, uh, is is likely to give power just just by the fact of its existence. You know, even apart from what it says, gives power to administrators and institutions charged with implementing it. Um, and then I think this is an important point in the context of Islamophobia. Um, in the UK, for example, we live in this in a world where prevent, uh, prevent legislation where, you know, governments, I mean, uh, sorry, individuals, uh, teachers and so forth are encouraged to be suspicious of Islam and suspicious of Muslims from the beginning. Right. We, there's so many stories about this in the newspapers of um, just kind of ref, reflexive um prejudice. And so what, what, what would it mean um, to have a kind of definition of Islamophobia and to, to be a government that, that is uh, claiming to punish Islamophobia in certain ways, which is obviously, you know, in some many ways that's a good thing, but it's already, the context is a very racist context and the government itself is implicated in that, in that racism. Very difficult to think about. Um, okay, so just to get to the, the definitions, a few definitions of racism, um, I may have to go through this quickly um, just because there's so much so much to cover. Um, so the the ready me the first detailed discussion um, of is interesting of, of, of Islamophobia um, as a concept uh, was introduced by the Ready Me Commission on Anti-Semitism, 
in uh, sorry, the, sorry, the Runnymede Commission. Uh, that's, that's a typo, obviously. Uh, this, uh, yeah, the Runnymede Commission on Antisemitism. This is an organization that is not that is that is more generally um, promoted to racial equality uh, for Muslims and others. Um, but yeah, in a report called uh, called uh, a, a very light sleep for the persistence and dangers of antisemitism in 1994. Um, and what's interesting is that 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 discussion of Islamophobia um, was uh, linked involved a kind of um, equivalence or a comparison between the experience of anti-Jewish prejudice. And there are obviously many similarities, right? It's particularly uh, the fact that that it does require kind of an extended concept of race to think about both anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, that it's it's not, you know, th there are racializing aspects of it. I, I think it's very useful to think of it as a form of racism, but but it's not the, the necessarily the first thing that people think about because be, being Islam is it can be it can be of any people of any race and, and people who who look Muslim may not be Muslim and so forth. So it, it, it requires it's a kind of um, not as not as obvious or not. It's a bit, a bit more different than anti-black racism, for example. Um, so the the Readymade report um, defined Islamophobia as an outlook or worldview involving an unfounded dread and dislike of Muslims, which results in practices of exclusion and discrimination. And I'll just flag, um, just just to kind of anticipate the the, the def other definitions, I'll show you that this is. So I think I think that kind of comparison between Jews and Muslims is is is, is really helpful and really necessary. And that's a good thing about this this discussion this, in, in this quote here on the top. Um, but yeah, but it's no, note the kind of as I as I said, a definition without clear clear temporal boundary. So here's a discussion of uh, Jews and Muslims being perceived as, as hostile um, foreigners and intruders um, in the medieval period, uh, with Jews seen as Christ killers. It's going back quite a long time in time. So there's a kind of transtemporal approach here to the task of defining Islam, um, Islamophobia. And then just to, this is taken further by Todd Green in Islamophobia, um, 2019. He says, Islamophobia is a modern word for prejudice that dates back to the Middle Ages and that permeates Western societies in the 21st century. Um, so that's just worth noting that that incredibly broad time span, I, I think, and, and it, it has, can be and has been challenged by other thinkers who would look at things like the war on terror as being much more determinative of, of the experience of Islamophobia now in this moment than say the Crusades, right? Um, I mean, that's, that's, you could certainly do that if you want to, but then the question is like, what do you get from that kind of, those kinds of temporal jumps? Um, is, is an account of contemporary Islamophobia that roots it in medieval prejudice useful for understanding and fighting it in the present? And the same question might be made of anti-Semitism and, and just to, just to, um, to, to bring this back to the IHRA definition, that that's exactly what that definition does, right? It's, it's the, it just aims for the, the most broad possible understanding of anti-Semitism you, anti you could possibly imagine. Um, and, and, I, and I think we could argue that that, that, that very broad understanding of anti-Semitism has led to a lot of um, some of the, the, the freedom of expression problems with, with, the, uh, with, with that definition. Uh, so here is uh, most most recently and relevantly, there was in 2018, um, an all-party parliamentary uh, group on British Muslims issued a report um, uh, calling for a, a, a definition of Islamophobia uh, and uh, the adoption of it by the government. And I th this report explicitly links back to the IHRA definition and and and. and Kind of notes that as a context in which, in which, if you know, if 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 um, uh, the UK government is going to be adopting a definition of of anti-Semitism, then they should be adopting a definition of Islamophobia. And you know, in pure, as a point of pure equity, that makes sense. That would seem to make sense, right? Um, that obviously, that, that given what I've said about the IJRA definition, you can see why that that might worry me a bit. But I will. One thing I do want to point out is that I think it's very useful that this definition. Um, this definition usefully uh, roots Islamophobia in racism, and that that actually makes it very different from the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, which which kind of treats treats Jew Jewish anti-Jewish prejudice as a kind of case unto itself. So so it says Islamophobia is rooted in racism, um, and is a type of op racism that targets expressions of Muslimness or perceived Muslimness. So I think that that's great. That's a really positive step 
Um, but I guess the the whole problem of kind of the operationalization of Islamophobia is not thought, thought through that much, very much. And given what we've seen taking place with the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, of, of it being kind of abused and misused, I think that's just something worth thinking about. So we shouldn't just ask... Prof uh, Professor, you're just coming up to 20 minutes now. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, we shouldn't just ask, how do we define Islamophobia? That can be a kind of interesting subject to debate, talk about, but especially if we're interested in freedom of expression, the equally important question to ask would be, not just how do we define it, not just like what is it, the content of that definition, but how is that different definition going to be used? You know, who is it going to be adopted by? Um, is it going to be used in disciplinary contexts? Uh, in what ways and so forth? Um, and okay, I'm not going to talk about the details of that report just for time's sake. Um, but just to explain that there's some of the, some of the, um, uh, other definitions of Islamophobia or responses that, that just offer a little bit of a different take very briefly. Um, Salman Sayyid in Thinking Through Islamophobia uh, says, describes Islamophobia as the, the disciplining of Muslims by reference to an antagonistic Western horizon. So, so that, that's a very modern definition, disciplining of Muslims. He's not talking about the Middle Ages, right? He says, um, such an understanding rejects the view often taken by many well-meaning Muslims to understand it as a trans-historical phenomena. Uh, um, so he doesn't consider uh, every moment of Islamic hate history where Muslims are marginalized or excluded as an instance of Islamophobia. The first Islamophobes would then be found among the Meccan aristocracy, right, who oppose the prophet. Um, so, uh, yeah, and that, that last slide sentence is also significant. Such an interpretation is similar to the perennially popular accounts of anti-Semitism as the longest hatred. And, and that, that just had, I think we just see, we've seen the consequences of that. It doesn't work. It, it's, it's harmful, not just to Jews, but to Palestinians as well. Um, so I think that's, that, that's why one reason why I would kind of advocate a specific um, a definition of possible focus on contemporary experiences. Um, and then there's another definition that, um, that also follows on that by, uh, in the book, What is Islamophobia, which I really recommend. Um, and uh, just to skip forward, to, uh, since I have a few minutes, only a few minutes left, I just want to, I would just point to a response um, quickly to uh, one way in which I think this, the um, uh, APPG report on Islamophobia uh, and, and their, their proposed definition is, is, is being in a, in a very actually limited way, uh, it's being kind of taken on by a few politicians. This is nothing, this is really nothing compared to what's been happening with the IHRA definition, which I think is, 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 is a disaster, as I said. Um, but we see a little, a, a kind of flavor of an attempt to, to move in that direction, not really successfully, but it's just worth noting, right? Um, uh, so there's a tweet, this is, I think, after the, uh, soon after the, the APPG report was released on Islamophobia, um, you see Saeed Warsi, a conservative MP, um, arguing kind of uh, on the basis of the fact of the adoption of the IHRA definition, she's 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 hoping for an adopt for an adoption of uh, Islamophobia, and she 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 reaches out to her Jewish brothers and sisters to quote that tweet, um, and my Jewish parliamentary colleagues to stand with us and what and want for us what you rightly want for yourselves. Uh, we cannot allow a government, she writes, to play politics in this way. We all deserve protection. So I just think this is a case where, you know, one should kind of look, distinguish between what's being said and, and what the actual implications are of the words in action. Um, it's a very, you know, sensible thing to, um, to kind of want to find solidarity between, between Jewish and Muslim peoples. But, but, but she's, so she's protesting against the rejection of the government by, of the definition of Islamophobia. Uh, and then, and then looking at how uh, you can see from the, the newspaper headline, uh, Jewish groups welcome government calls for universities to adopt IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, as if that was a good thing, as if that was something to be supported. Um, and I, yeah, I think that there are other ways to look at that. Um, and uh, just, I guess, I, I had also an example of, and yes, another thing. So as I mentioned, the the um, I'm not going to go into this example in detail, but it was it, it was a. A, a, an exchange between the labor MP, Jess Phillips, in which she kind of seems to be very convinced that she knows what Islam is. Um, she's telling a Muslim, in fact, that he's a bad Muslim. Uh, he, 
I can post this elsewhere if people are interested. Or, um, but anyway, in this, in, yeah, just in short, short she, she tells them that I want to protect you. I want to protect the Muslim community. She doesn't like the fact that he's protesting against same-sex marriage. But it's just an interesting case of, of what, it, what happens when a government becomes very, very tied, a secular government, um, tied to a very specific notion of what Islam is and should be. Um, and, and kind of even tries to educate Muslims into that, uh, right? So that there are good and bad Muslims. Uh, and and, and it, it seems to me there's a danger. It, it, it definition of Islamophobia necessarily defines Muslims, and so also encourages the government to think in normative terms about what a, what a Muslim is and is not is and is not. And one one asks, I, I guess I and I'm just about out of, out of time too. So, um, but um, what I think we should be asking, like, is that really what we want our governments to do, especially governments like secular governments that aren't really committed to Islam in any way? Could that not also backfire? Um, and am I, yeah, I just, I just have a minute or two or. Yeah. Yeah. Just uh, if you could just wrap up. Yeah. Just a minute or so. Um, yeah. So, 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 so that's the, obviously there's a lot to be probed about the boundaries of such a definition. Um, but just to quickly walk through lessons that I have learned from, from, again, my, I'm approaching this particularly from the IHRA definition perspective. I think those, that's where we've seen, as a matter of actual empirical fact, we've seen bad things happen. We haven't seen that happen with the definitions of Islamophobia, but the potential is there just because it's in the nature of the definition itself. And so I would say, um, I think basing a definition around hate crimes, right, around acts rather than words and attitudes, uh, it, it, it should be the foundation for a really productive definition that protects, protects people, protects Muslims without... Um, criminalizing freedom of expression. Um, it should be as intersectional as possible, which I think is, is something that the APPG report achieves. In other words, it it's, it's understands racism as something that doesn't just occur, or Islamophobia doesn't occur in isolation. It's related to other kinds of prejudice. Um, yeah, and and that's, um, I, I won't go into every little detail. I'll just end with, um, right. Uh, I mean, I have a list here of, of other things I've published on the, the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism. And, and I just mentioned quickly that I'm now working on a, a book about the IHRA definition, but also looking, thinking through the implications of that for the uh, any definitions of Islamophobia for Verso, which should be out um, in 2022. So thank you so much. This is a real pleasure. And I'm looking forward to the conversation.